Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's Exploring by the CDR Pants event. My name is Joe Gorowski, and I'll be your host for today. If you've been tuning in this month, you know that our theme has been big cats. So we do this every December. It's always a ton of fun. We talk to scientists, explorers, conservationists uh, all over the world. So Africa, India, um, South America, Central America, North America as well when we talk about cougars and mountain lions. So really excited for today's event. We are hanging out with Tanyue Mwitwa. She is a Zambian wildlife biologist and conservation educator working to protect large carnivores in her home country with the nonprofit organization Zambian Carnivore Program. So as a believer and supporter of community-based conservation, she's, she's also dedicated to exploring effective ways of bringing the local communities into wildlife conservation through awareness programs, through capacity building, youth empowerment, as well as citizen science initiatives. So her work to protect big cats in Zambia has been going on for quite some time now. She's been featured in several BBC documentaries and national geographic videos as a National Geographic Explorer. So I'm going to bring Tandy in live with us here uh, from Zambia this morning. Hey, Tandy, how are you? Hey, how are you? Good, is good. You well, it is so good to have you joining us live. Um, I know just before the talk, uh, you mentioned that you had to close the door uh, because we could have baboons come and visit. So you are right out uh, in the park uh, doing incredible work. So we're excited to learn a little bit more about it today. Uh, and then, of course, we've got a great group of students joining on YouTube, as well as live on camera, and they're going to have lots of questions for you. Awesome. Yeah, I'm, I'm right outside the National Park, but it's completely surrounded by wildlife. So we have different species walking through camp. There's bush bugs, elephants, uh, baboons. So baboons in particular, they see an open door and they're like, oh, let's check out what's inside. And they can be. It can be quite destructive. But yeah, I'm really glad to talk to you all today and hopefully we'll have an interesting chat. All right, very cool. Well, I'm gonna let you take over for a little bit. I have the presentation here on my end. I'm just getting my screen ready to share it. So that should be ready now. Uh, and I will let you take over for a little bit. Awesome, thank you very much. And yeah, thanks for helping out to share the screen. I'm just going to do a short presentation, just introducing everybody to the work that we do here. Um, and then from there, um, we'll, hopefully after that, we'll have um, a discussion and uh, questions from the audience. So the talk is mostly going to be about an intro to the work that we do and then dialing in on the lions, talking about the threats um, that they're facing, the work we're doing to protect them, and then um, why there is a reason for hope for uh, big cats like lions, despite all these issues. Um, and then I'm just going to share a little bit about, I think one of my favorite uh, days in the bush uh, with lions at the very end. And then after that, hopefully we can get into some form of discussion. So um, if you move to the next slide, um, it will be a summary uh, showing our approach to conservation. And then also there'll be a map uh, showing where in Zambia we are. So for those that don't know, Zambia is a slightly large country smack in the center of Southern Africa. Um, that map there shows you the outline as well as a little bit of the neighboring countries. But the key areas there I wanted to highlight are those in green. Um, I am based in South Luangwa National Park, which is in the eastern side of the country, and it is labeled there. Um, I work for an organization called the Zambian Carnival Program. Our mission is conservation of large carnivals as well as their homes, their habitats that they depend on. Um, so we try and do carnival conservation using three main approaches. The first one being science-based. This is where we try and identify the threats that the different carnivals that we work with are facing. So we try and answer the question, what is affecting the survival of lions, wild dogs, hyenas, leopards, and um, other animals like cheetah in the bush? What are their limiting factors to uh, population growth? And that information is used to feed um, management strategies. And that also comes under the conservation action approach, 
where we try and do things to address these threats that are um, identified by the research. So usually the threats that we work on um, are human caused. And so we work with a variety of partners to address those issues. And then the conservation capacity um, aspect stems from our belief that in order to protect, to protect these animals long-term, you have to have people that are interested in working in this field for the long haul. And it involves giving them skills and you know leadership training so that they can help protect lions and wild dogs as well as other carnivores. So those are the three different um, approaches we take to carnival conservation. And the, the follow-up pictures will go in a bit of detail. So the next slide is um, giving an example of the different areas of research that we have um, as an organization. So some of the scientific data we collect is on the populations themselves, uh, trying to understand what is happening with them, what's the sex and age structure of these populations, how many animals are adults above the age of eight, for example, how many are cubs below the age of two. So this gives you a sense of, you know, where is your population going to be going? Is it going to decline because of a lot of old females? Is something else at play that is affecting the population structure? So there's a lot of info that we uh, collect just to understand population dynamics. And then I mentioned studying threats. Um, this is quite important because in order to solve a problem, you need to know what the source of that problem is. So if big cuts are declining in different systems, we need to understand what is causing that decline and then we can better and more strategically approach the problem. So I'll touch on that a little bit, um, being specific to African lions. Um, then the other thing we study is the space use of these different carnivore species. We want, want to know where are they going, what sort of areas are they using to breed, what sort of areas are they using for hunting, and what is at play in those particular areas. And then we also have a new aspect of our work, which is human carnivore conflict. This is pretty new in the landscape um, because this is an area that has historically not had a lot of livestock because of certain you know conditions but it's a new problem that we're starting to tackle and hopefully it doesn't become full-blown um, as it is in other areas so the picture there is just showing one of the methods that we use for our research work and this is radio collaring so that's us uh, putting a collaring uh, putting a device on this lion that will help us monitor her pride and give us insights into um, just what is happening to lions in the area. Um, the follow-up slide is showing um, us doing conservation action type of work. So I mentioned under conservation action, we address the threats that are identified by research. So for African lions, one of the threats tends to be wire snare poaching and you know there's lions that are caught in these wire snares and we have the services of a vet that is nearby to help us rescue these animals that have been injured um, and then we also work with other collaborating partners for example law enforcement departments these are people that go out in the bush look for poachers and stop them from doing any illegal activity. So we work with these people to share information about the areas that the lions heavily depend on for various things like breeding and hunting. And hopefully those areas are protected for the benefit of the species that we work with. Um, so that is mostly the conservation action related work. And then the follow up slide again is a conservation action slash capacity building um type activity that aims at addressing the threats that we're facing namely human wildlife conflict mitigation in this case and then also just training people up so that they are conservation leaders and conservation practitioners um, in their own right 
And the follow-up photo is of the different programs we do with secondary school students as we try and promote interest in nature-based careers. So this includes field trips. Um, the next picture has the different uh, science projects. Oh, oh, I thought I had another photo in there that I missed. Apologies. I had a photo of um, uh, students out in the field doing a camera trap study, just trying to gain basic skills in scientific research, which is just using camera traps to understand the variety of species. Um, that exist in a particular area. So it's not groundbreaking science in any shape or form, but it's one of those things that gets people's interest in science peaked, people's interest in you know, critical thinking and thinking about conservation and research as being two sides of the same coin really. So um, yeah, I thought I had that photo in there, but uh, apologies. So that was just a, uh, a, a quick overview of the different activities that we do when it comes to carnival conservation in the country. And the next couple of slides are talking specifically about lions and the threats that they face um, out here and also in other parts of Africa. So habitat loss is one of them. This is where um, the areas that they've historically inhabited are not available anymore. This is because maybe the areas have been designated as farming blocks or areas are being developed for settlement um, or you know being taken up by just other types of infrastructure development. So this is a problem for African lions because they're an apex predator that requires huge amounts of space to be able to go about their life processes. So what happens is there's a lot of break in connection between, sorry, in connectivity between protected areas. For example, the wildlife corridors that these animals used to use to move from one national park to another are not there anymore, or they're not there in the form that they used to be um, in the past. So this is, again, problematic for the species. I, I don't think this is a problem that is just isolated to Zambia or lions in particular, but yeah, habitat loss is a, uh, is a cause for concern for this particular species. And then another thing that I've already talked about is wire snare poaching. In many places, the lions are not targeted uh, by poachers, but their caught is bycatch. Um, in snares or traps that are set for edible um, animals, for example, small to medium-sized antelopes. Um, because these traps are not selective in any way, anything that walks through them can be uh, caught and can be injured. And so this is how lions also get affected. Um, like I mentioned, they cover huge areas to move, to find mates, and that exposes them to them being caught um, in wire snares. So I mentioned earlier, we work with law enforcement partners and other government departments to try and address this problem uh, through rescuing animals that we see injured and then also preemptively pre um, preventing any sort of injuries from happening by having directed law enforcement activities in areas that are identified as being absolutely critical uh, for lions and, and other carnivores as well. Um, and then the other one is human-lion conflict. Um, I mentioned this initially because, um, the, because it's a new thing. It's still, we're still at a stage where I, I think we can manage it enough that it doesn't escalate to the point of like, you know, entire prides being poisoned in retaliation. Um, but yeah, it's, we're still learning a lot. We've had the opportunity to visit other projects in East Africa that have dealt with this problem for a long time to just see over there what is working and what is, what, what is not, what can we adapt for this system and cultural setup um, and yeah, it's been very beneficial talking to those projects and learning from them. And I think it has made it possible for us to also develop our collaborations. 
So the next series of slides, it should be three photos kind of highlighting some of what I've talked about. That is a slide talking about the, snare, the snaring rescues that we do. Um, this is a vet out in uh, the central part of Zambia called Kafue National Park. Uh, he's treating a lion that had been caught in a trap around the neck and she had a bit of a cut there. And then the next slide is of a lion uh, who lives here in um, South Luangwa National Park, just where I am. He also had an incident where he was caught in a snare around his neck. Luckily, it wasn't too bad. We were able to treat his wound and he's made a full recovery. He looks so much nicer than this because this was about uh, two years ago. Um, his mane is so much nicer. He's now nicknamed Cutthroat. Um, it's, it's, it's just, yeah, he visits us in camp here sometimes because this whole area is within his territory. So they do recover from these sorts of injuries once treated. Um, and then the second, the next slide should be a photo just depicting um, some of the conflict related issues. It's because mostly these lions go out in community areas and kill people's livestock. And this is quite bad for both people and lions because the people lose um, their source of income and food. And then the lions can also be killed in retaliation, which is also not great. And then the other photo is of uh, an enclosure that we're helping farmers reinforce to help reduce some of this conflict. Um, this is something we're trying out uh, recently um, and seeing how it will work. And then we can promote this as a predator-proof um, enclosure that people can adopt and hopefully reduce the problem. So yeah, it's it's a series of threats. Um, and sometimes it can look like, you know, there's too much going on, so many uh, problems, so many things that are wrong. But I wanted to share using the map um, that's on the next slide. Um, it shows um, different, so those different dots, the, the different colored dots, um, movement or location points for the different prides of lions that we intensively monitor here. Um, so you see a lot of these lions are not only using the national park. Um, they're also out in the game management area, which is the community areas. And these are the brown bits on the map. The national parks are the gray um then the national parks are the gray areas, as you can see from the label. So you see these animals utilizing both areas. You know, it's a difficult type of coexistence, but I, I think it's still possible. And the positive thing about it is that, you know, despite all these issues, these animals respond very well to any management interventions that you can put in place, provided they are consistent and they very strategically done. Um, I want to draw your attention up north to the little label there that says Luambe National Park. Um, this is one of those really cool, I think, recovery stories um, that show that these animals are incredibly resilient. These ecosystems, no matter how depleted or isolated they may be, there might, you know, sign there will be signs of recovery. The animals will come back once you put the effort in. So we've been monitoring um, the lion activity in Luambe National Park, I think for the past three seasons. And there's a lot of changes happening in that national park. It was one of those for a long time that was considered depleted. So very low numbers of game, very little management and law enforcement activity to put things like poaching under control. But you know, with investment over the past three years, we've been able to see a change in the number of herbivores that are there. There's an a change in the variety of herbivores as well. So there's more antelope species and more of those antelope as well. And you know, when the prey base recovers, it's only a matter of time before the lions start coming and using the area as well. So the two green and pink 
dots are two prides that we very recently just this year noticed start coming into Luambe and spending a bit of time there um so it was quite nice for us to see for because for years we were only encountering just one pride in the national park and then we've gone from one pride to three prides which is quite exciting and you know if the pattern continues um we'll see these guys use the park more you know regularly and the more these guys use the park and they're able to stay in a stable manner it means they can produce and breed more lions that can disperse and move into other areas as well so again there you can see there's a lot of movement and overlap in and outside the protected area so these points are just from the month of november but if i had like october and september in there as well you'd see all these points covering the entire park and then going further north there's another national park to the north there called north loangwa national park you'd see them go there as well so it was an indication for us that you know certain landscapes once you put in measures to protect the area boost up the numbers of game the predators would naturally come back and this was without any reintroduction this was without any like you know flying in lions from anywhere it was a completely natural process that was facilitated by just more security and so that's that's quite amazing i think things like this just give us a bit more energy to continue working even when like you know it seems there's a whole list of problems that we list as affecting lions and also yeah it was an indication that it's pretty key still to maintain connectivity between national parks when you see these different prides move through two different parks through community lands into another park spend a few days there do the thing and then go back to their usual patrolling patterns um it's quite exciting so yeah that was um just like you know it's a spark i think that i i wanted to share that you know it's not all uh doom and gloom there's some positivity there nature responds in incredible ways um once you you know just make it possible so it's it's um it's it was quite exciting for us anyway to do um these collar deployments and being able to just see where these lions are going um and then finally i i just wanted to share just a little um i think story regarding like one of my favorite uh days in the field working with lions obviously there's a lot of difficult days you are out in the bush for a very long time it's hot the sesa flies but sometimes you get these sightings that are just you know they 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 just super super uplifting and they make you want to do this over and over um so these two photos are from 2017 um earlier in the year around april somewhere there um april is when we normally begin our field season um every year cuz the rains would have just finished and it, most of the park has become accessible and we can get to these different places and see animals that we haven't seen maybe for 5 5 months or so um and so this was in 2000, 2017 um we had just finished you know 2016 was a really difficult year for us um as a project there were so many challenges starting from you know permit issues broken vehicles all those sorts of things and this day was one of it was the first day we'd gone back into the field when everything was considered okay back to normal we're good we can resume normal operations and we found this small group of lions there was a male there and a female with one cub so it was like a little family mother father and the, and, the, and one child um it was it was really cool cuz you know lion cubs are exciting to see all the time but this guy was super playful um you see on the next photo he tried everything his mother tried um him, his mother went up a tree his mother went up a tree 
And she was also like, you know, wandering at the bottom of the tree, trying to think, oh, what do I do? Then he went all the way up as well. And when he finally went up, it was just the most amazing thing, seeing them late in the, in the day, sunlight hitting them really nicely, and just this line exploring its, this whole new world in from a different height. And the best part was at the end of the day when, you know, dusk had fallen, the sun, the sun had gone down completely, the birds were singing, and then they all started roaring, the, the two adults. And the cub also just started imitating. And it was more of a meow, <laughs> meow, but it was, it was quite, uh, it, it felt like such an amazing welcome back to the bush, despite, you know, all the challenges and the difficult year we had had before. And it kind of, um, I think for everybody that was there, it was a reaffirmation to say, you know, this is such an incredible species and let's continue doing whatever we can to protect them despite all these difficulties. So it, it was such a, a, a beautiful, a beautiful chorus. I couldn't send um, a video because my, my internet was going to take a long time to load and the PowerPoint was not going to send. But yeah, it was, it was such an amazing um, scene. You know, I've had quite a few of those, but this one, I think sticks out is one of my my favorite. So yeah, I just wanted to share that since it's you know big cat themed, um, you know events and yeah, I hope um, I hope you guys have a few questions and I, I'll pass it over to you, Joe. All right, I'm just going to come back from the screen share there. Perfect. Well, Tandy, thank you so much. That was such a great presentation. I love the work that you're doing. Um, and you know, I loved in some of those earlier photos, uh, when you were out in the field, your, your whole team looked like they were women. So it looks like you bring a lot of women out into the field with you, which I think is, is just awesome. So very cool. Thank you. All right. Well, let's start grabbing some questions. Cause I know we have lots. I can see the YouTube chat has been very active. So, uh, those tuning in via YouTube, if you start putting your questions in again, uh, at the bottom, then I'll be able to see, uh, the newest ones coming in. But for now, Let's start meeting some groups. So why don't we start with Mrs. Hood's fifth graders? I'm going to bring her in uh, live with us. There she is. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Hood, how are you? Hi, how's everyone? Hi, um, so how are you? Great, thank you. We had a bunch of questions. So the first one, um, Abby wants to know, what can we here in Pennsylvania, in the United States, do to help protect lions? What role can we play? And thank you for okay. everything you do, do for them. Thank you very much for, for listening. So it's it's pretty important to share the information about the plight of uh, lions out here. So a lot of people don't know um, that African lions are in trouble in a lot of places because a lot of the wildlife films that you see, it's, you know, it's one lion related film after another. And a lot of people think, oh, they're, they're doing great. They're just everywhere. But they're incredibly hard to see in, in many places. They're being affected by all these different threats that I've mentioned. I didn't add on there that, you know, there's an increasing trade in lion parts. So the way elephants are being poached for ivory Lions are also being poached in certain places for their skins and their teeth. And so the more people know about this problem, um, the more people will be there to work towards the protection of lions, the more people that will be able to donate to various, you know, organizations that work on the ground to protect these species. So a very big thing is knowledge, first of all. Um, accurate knowledge to begin with because, you know, there's all sorts of information out there. Um, but, you know, if you have accurate information regarding the threats that they're facing, um, you know, the most important threats to address as well because there's different degrees. There's one problem and then there's another problem that's quite significant and requires the most attention. So information about all that and then sharing it with our networks. Like I mentioned, it will increase, number one, the number of people that are aware of the problem, and number two, the number of people that can help solve the problem, be it through you know, donations and, and stuff like that. 
All right. Great question to get us started. Let's go to Illinois this time. We've got Ms. Michael's crew uh, joining us virtually. How are we doing, Ms. Michael? I'm great. I'm great. We have a we have a lot of questions, but I'm going to call on Melanie. Melanie, would you unmute yourself and ask your question real loud? They're all zooming uh, in. Oh, where me. do lions sleep? Do they just sleep in the grass? Where do lions sleep? Do they just sleep out in the grass, or are they hidden somewhere? So they they can sleep anywhere, really, where they you know where they 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 found or resting for that particular day. But they'll sleep in the grass. They're incredibly hard to see because they're brown in color. And in the dry season, the color of the grass is the same as the fur. So they're very hard to see when they're sleeping in the grass. Um, but there's also some lions that also like to catch a snooze up in the tree. So I showed a photo earlier of, you know, the mother lion and her cub up in the tree. It's not all lions that do that, but some of them like to go up and they'll also just rest if they find a nice branch. Um, but usually, yeah, they'll, they'll find a really thick bush or a shady tree and then they'll sleep there. If they sleep in the grass, um, they'll start, they'll sleep pretty much the whole day. They'll, they'll finish hunting at maybe, if they did a morning hunt, they'll finish hunting at like eight in the morning and then they'll go to sleep for the whole day. And by the time it's like 5 p.m., they'll start coming out of the grass to maybe look for water or sit out in the open while scoping out, you know, their dinner options. Um, but yeah, they'll, they'll sleep pretty much wherever they can that is shady and nice and cool. All right, I'm gonna quickly snag a question here from YouTube. Ms. Dykstra's class in, in Guelph, Ontario are curious about um, the mane. Does the, what purpose does the lion, the male, uh, uh, the mane serve? So the mane is said to serve a number of purposes. So one of them is it's a sign of just how healthy a lion is. Um, so the bigger the mane, the darker it is, it shows like, you know, super good genes. And it's an advertisement to all the females that, oh, look at me, I'm super strong. And I, I can make really strong cubs and and, um, and I can protect my territory quite well. So, um, you know, people that have done studies like in East Africa, for example, they've seen that females show a preference for bigger and uh, darker manes. But we live out here in a system that has male lions that don't really have big manes and they are also super successful when it comes to holding territories and breeding and, and things like that. Um, other people say manes are also important for protection because male lions fight um, with each other quite a lot to take over territories and breeding rights to different females in the pride. So they say the more mane an animal has, the harder they are to uh, kill. But yeah, I'm not sure about the um, that particular use um, of, of the mane. But yeah, it's usually linked to breeding success. All right, very cool. I'm gonna bring in Ms. McIntosh's crew. They're joining us in Brampton. I think they're a grade five, six class. How are yeah. we doing this morning? We're good, how are you? Good. Good, we've got a good question here. It's uh, when a lion that you've helped or rescued after they see you again, do they remember you? <laughs> oh, I wish they would, but I don't think so. Um, because these are, you know, 100% uh, wild lions. They don't, when we rescue them, the, the mode of rescue itself is, it just takes like, you know, an hour and a half. So there's really no bonding time between um, us and the lion, for example. So if we find a lion out in the bush injured and we have to treat them from the time the vet tranquilizes the animal and from the time they up to the time the animal wakes up and goes and rejoins its friends it's usually yeah one hour and a half to you know two hours and most of that time the lion is completely asleep they don't know what's happening by the time they wake up would have also 
uh, backed off. Um, and so they recover, 100% of their recovery is with their family. We just clean the wound, give them an antibiotic that will help fight infection, and then also maybe a long-acting anti-inflammatory drug to help with the pain and the swelling. So they're asleep by the time we finish and we pull up, pull away. And when they wake up, they usually don't know what happened except that they feel better. Um, I don't know if, I don't think they associate us with, you know, having helped them. I don't think they recognize us individually because if we're in the vehicle, they normally don't see that there's a person inside there. Sometimes maybe they do if you not do, you make like big movements or anything like that. But yeah, I don't think they, they lock in into our faces and recognize us, unfortunately. But again, maybe it's fortunately because yeah, we, we, we don't really want that in a way. Time today. All right, great question. I'm going to jump oh. to Mr. Shokai's group who are joining us from Kingston, Ontario. Uh, if they have a question for us. Absolutely. I'm going to have Tristan come up actually and ask the question, if that's all right. Yeah, of course. Hey, Tristan. Thank you. What is poaching? Oh, <laughs> thank you. you. All right. Thanks, Tristan. So, poaching is when somebody goes out um, in the bush and gets you know, something from the bush without a permit. Usually they go out and uh, kill, for example, um, in Ontario you'd have deer, I guess. Um, if you go and kill deer or any other wildlife species without a permit, that is considered illegal and it, it is termed as poaching. So when I was talking about poaching in regards to the impact it has on lions, it's because people want to go into the bush and uh, catch some antelope illegally. So they either shoot the animal and take home and eat the meat without getting the proper paperwork done, or they'll set traps for these antelope in the bush so that you know when the antelope walks through the trap it can get caught and then they can find it and and take it so poaching is illegal people are encouraged to get permits if they want to uh you know shoot wildlife or uh do different things so poaching yeah is is an illegal activity where somebody extracts a natural resource from a park especially um with yeah with without a permit all right, great question. We're gonna jump to Miss Woodley's crew, third graders hanging out in Brantford. I'm gonna bring them in. Oh, it looks like they got the camera going too. Hey, third graders. Hi. We have a question here. Nice and loud for us. How many animals do you see with snares attached to them on a daily basis? Oh, how many animals do we see? How many animals do we see with snares on a daily basis? Yes. Yep. Okay. So, thankfully, it's not on a daily basis. There's different species that, you know, we record over the course of the month. But luckily, this year, I'm very happy to say we haven't seen any lions with, um, with snares which is a really good thing because we were very worried this year with, you know, people having not had a lot of uh, food from the floods. We thought that poaching was, was going to go up um, and then lions were going to be caught as, um, you know, as the unintended uh, victims. But we, we worked really hard with a lot of our partners to ensure that we maintained a lot of presence in those areas and thankfully, we are almost at the end of 2020 with no um, with no lion seen with uh, snares. But as far as other species like giraffes, elephants, buffaloes, and some puku, um, in the past in the past three or four months, we've recorded about 20 different animals, 
and we've been able to uh, treat about 14 of those. Some we just haven't been able to relocate and uh, find again. Uh, but luckily, yeah, I'm, I'm very happy to say this year we haven't had any lion snaring incidents. So in any particular year, the ones that we see um, will amount to maybe five or six uh, different individuals. And those are just the ones that, you know, we are lucky enough to be seen. But then there's others in further out places that don't get uh, cited or reported. All right. So we've got Miss Hewitt Six Sevens joining us in Burlington. Go ahead with the question, crew. Oh, Mike is muted. Yeah. Are you able to unmute for? There we go. Oh, hey, Six Seven. Uh, Michael, we were wondering whether you've had any like close calls with like the lions. If you've ever been like attacked or bit or anything like that. <laughs> I, I think luckily um, I've never had any such uh, close calls. Uh, knock on wood, hopefully, you know, it, it, it doesn't happen. But I've had um, encounters where during an immobilization, an animal comes up a bit early. And so they are work before everybody is ready to back off and move away. And this happened many years ago, just on my very first day when I started volunteering with the organization I'm working for now. Um, this animal, this we, we immobilized this male lion, but the darts um, didn't discharge as, it, as expected. So he only got partial doses. So he was very lightly asleep. And he happened to fall down in the middle of the hot sun. And you typically don't want that with an immobilized animal. You want them laying down in the shade nicely because during the time they are down and tranquilized, they can't really maintain their body temperature well. So this was the time when um, the team that I was with were trying to carry this lion to a shadier spot and um, I was the youngest and the shortest person in the group at the time. So I was just given, you know, camera bags and other gear to carry. And, and so I was walking behind the four guys that were carrying the lion on their shoulders on a stretcher. And so I'm walking behind them and I see this lion just sit up on <laughs> while he's still on these guys' shoulders. And he starts looking around and I'm like, ah, that, that lion is awake. So that, that changed everything. You know, they gently put him down and we're like, oh, let's wait for him to go to sleep again. But yeah, he, he, he didn't go back to sleep at that point. Um, you know, they started, they told me to start walking to the car um, just so in case anything happened, um, I wouldn't get attacked since it was my first day on the job. Um, so he, he, you know, he, he was, he was asleep, but then when I started walking, I might've stepped on a, like a twig or something because he looked in my direction and we had this staring contest for maybe two to three minutes, but he was so dragged up. I think that he could barely see and he very quickly lost interest in me. And then he just tried to get away um from us as much as possible so that's the only incident you know where i've been uh face to face on foot with um and a lion with a lion that semi awake but i was strangely calm during that time i think because nobody else in the group was panicking uh, or maybe if they were panicking they were just doing it inwardly and uh I, I i thought oh they're confident so this is not a tricky situation at all but yeah, luckily we haven't had any of those dicey situations where like, you know, we've been attacked or anything like that. All right, grabbing a, a question from YouTube from Mihar. He uh, is wondering um, what would happen to the ecosystem if lions disappeared? How important are they in the ecosystem? Good question. So this is essentially why we try and do all this conservation work. It's to keep lions from uh, disappearing uh, from the ecosystem, just because these lions are at the very top of the food chain. So 
you take out that really key piece at the top of the food chain, there's a lot of impacts that will trickle down all the way to the bottom. For example, they're totally important for how ecosystems function because they help maintain the structure of those particular ecosystems. So they control the number of herbivores that are out there and the number of herbivores has an impact on a whole range of things like, you know, um, soils, the flow of rivers and just the hydrology of an entire area. That would change when you take out a top predator because suddenly a lot of places would become overgrazed. Um, that means the soil structure there completely changes. There's a lot of erosion that affects the flow of, you know, natural water systems. There's just a whole list of, you know, trickle down problems um, that can exist. And this is a concern for many people because numbers of lions are declining at a, you know, across the continent. And there's, the estimates vary between 20,000 to 30,000 animals left in the wild. And then not just the ecological effects that would affect the um you know, at the landscape, if lions were taken out of the equation, there's also economic factors as well. And there's also the social side of things. So it extends be beyond just the ecological impacts of losing a top predator like the African lion. And I, coming back to the ecological impacts as a species, we greatly, greatly depend on the function of, you know, these healthy ecosystems and the healthier they are, the healthier we are. So having lions is actually good for people's well-being. And if we did lose them, the impacts would trickle down to us as well. Okay. And just kind of one more question as we wrap up. I know there's about roughly 20,000 lions uh, in the wild left in all of Africa. About how big is the population in Zambia? Mm -hmm. So the Zambian lion population is estimated to be roughly around 1,200 to 1,800. So it's not a, 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 lot of, um, a lot of animals. It's a decline of about 50% from the last estimate, which uh, put the estimates in the country to be around 4,000. So, you know, the number of lions that we have now is comparable to what Kenya has, for example. The biggest populations are in Tanzania and um, in, in South Africa. And then here where we work in eastern Zambia, we've got about 500 to 700 of those 1,800 that are in Zambia. So it's a pretty key area for the conservation of the species in country because it's the largest estimated population. And then at a continent wide scale, it's also one of those areas that is still considered to be a stronghold for lions. And the stronghold is uh, defined as any area with uh, 500 or more uh, lions. So uh, the conservation work that we do here is pretty key to maintaining just 10 of those areas that are remaining in Africa with a population of uh, 500 or more. Um, so yeah, luckily in the past few years, the population we're mentioning, where we're monitoring here is about, um, about you know, stable, but we like to keep um, a finger on the pulse to just see like, you know, if it starts going down, being able to pick out why is it, um, why, why is it going down and what can we do about it? Yeah. All right. Well, I want to start off with a huge shout out to our YouTube uh, crew today. Thank you for sending in some great questions to our camera classrooms. Thank you so much for joining us uh, uh, and asking some of those questions live. And Tandy, it's always great to steal you for a few minutes from uh, Zambia. In fact, before I forget, one of our last events that we did together um, mm -hmm. was with one of our satellite units. So you were out in the field. Yeah. Um, and we were checking out the wild dogs and we even had a hyena come join us at the end, which was pretty cool. So I'm going to add that little banner there. If anybody wants to check it out, uh, I'm going to put it in the YouTube chat as well. If you want to see, uh, a little bit of the other, uh, species that, uh, Tandy works with. So I'm going to put that in the YouTube feed as well. 
I can share that with our camera classrooms. So, uh, Tandy, thank you so much. Tons of fun. You're doing amazing work. Uh, and, you know, keep doing what you're doing and keep that stronghold uh, going strong with the Lions. So and we look forward to, to some more events with you down the line. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm glad to have chatted with you all. Really amazing questions. And yeah, um, thanks for the opportunity. All right, everyone. We've got about a week and a half till Christmas break. Check out exploringbytheseat.com for a whole bunch more uh, events you can tune into before then. Again, thanks, everybody, and enjoy the rest of your days.